Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. If you are a fan of the true, creepy, and haunted stories, you have found the right channel. If you are new here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to check the description below and subscribe, like, share, and comment. With all that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Road Trip and Trucker Horror Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. I spent the past 10 years as a truck driver, so I've had my fair share of stories, but I'll share the strangest. Coming out of our Washington State Terminal, I was asked to take one of our drives to Southern California. Not a big deal. I've done it before, but let's meet our friend Gibson. You see, Gibson here seemed very normal, cheerful, and a delightful person to keep you company while talking your ear off. However, this all changes once the sun went down. Gibson here turns to me and says, Hey, can you pull over for a sec? I need to ward off the snake people. This is where my brain doesn't quite process this, and I say, What? He repeats the same line, and here's where my spidey sense tells me if Gibson doesn't ward off his snake people, I'm going to have a bigger problem than this guy's cookie getting flipped. So I pull over and he gets out. Now here comes the weird. He does this dance in front of my headlights. All I can say is he certainly does his snake warding dance. Now here's my dilemma. This guy really is a few fries short of a Happy Meal, but I was asked to drive his ass to SoCal. Unfortunately, I think too long about this and Gibson is sitting again next to me in the passenger seat as nothing, as if that weird ass dance didn't just happen. I drive 1200 miles without stopping, and Gibson gets to his new truck in Southern California, and I never give another person, I don't know, hmm, I'll say a lift, ever. Okay everyone, so here are three encounters that I had out driving on the road. Story number one. My trucking days were shit, but I got some good stories from them. Going south on I-75 in Georgia at around 3 a.m., I see this bright light maybe about two miles behind me. Not only is it super bright, but it is on the interstate and it is hauling ass. It's big too and it's moving faster than anything I think I'd ever seen. Now, earlier that day, I had called the guy who taught me how to drive, and he is really, really superstitious about life on the road. He would tell me stories about how a green apparition chased him in Florida when he was pulling too many miles, all kinds of stuff. I was already spooked from that conversation earlier. So, looking into my mirror and seeing this giant light flying towards me made my asshole clench onto the seat. This thing closes the distance between us and flies past me, probably doing around 120. I had the window down as it went past me. I felt this massive amount of heat when it passed me. I could finally tell what it was. Get this. It was a hay hauler, a truck that hauls a trailer designed for hay, and the entire load of hay in the back was ablaze. I jumped in the CB and screamed, Driver, your trailer is on fire! The driver comes back in a surprisingly calm voice with, I know, I'm just letting it burn off. I figured if I go fast enough, I can keep my cab from getting burned. Story number two. I got my CDLA in 2003 and was immediately hired by a company called PAM. 
They pay shit, but it was a good place to cut my teeth as a greenhorn. Once you get your CDL, the company that hires you sends you out with a driver trailer for about a month to teach you the ways of the road. And my trainer was a guy named Charlie. I mentioned him earlier, real superstitious guy. Charlie was a maniac. Every three days, I had to break up a fistfight between him and another driver, and it was always over shit-talking on the CB. He would snort flake, too, and stay awake for a week at a time and drive non-stop. Flake is this trucker drug, a mixture of speed, ephedra, anything you can get that will make your heart rate go up, crushed and snorted. Then he would go home, fall asleep for two days in his chair, and piss and shit on himself. His woman didn't care. Her house and bills were paid for, and she didn't have a need or want. Oh, he had no problem getting BJs from the lot lizards either. He even offered to me to get one over my birthday during the month I was out with him. All the travel centers of America in Roanoke, Virginia, they have this all-you-can-eat steak diner. He got me that and was trying to get me to accept a BJ. I was like, no, man, that shit is not for me. Lizard is an appropriate term for truck stop prostitute. They are the lowest rung on the prostitution ladder. Anyway, I'm trying to get across just how wild Charlie was. Fast forward to the end of the month as a trainee. I'm in Jacksonville, Florida at my home terminal, and I'm going to have my final test to see if I'm worthy of going first seat. That's what they call it, at least, when they let you go out on your own with your own truck. What they do is they get another driver who doesn't know you, put you in the truck with them, and he has you go through all the motions, driving, backing, etc. One of Charlie's good buddies was there. His handle was a slow hand. I can't remember his real name, and Charlie was like, Okay, driver, you're going to get your first seat test tonight. Are you ready? I'm like, yep, let's do it. He has me disconnect the tractor from the trailer. And myself, Charlie and Slowhand, drive to the Applebee's. Strange, I thought. I thought I was getting my... Wait a minute, blah, 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 blah. And myself, Charlie and Slowhand, drive to the Applebee's. Strange, I thought I was getting my test. Don't worry, driver, you'll get it after this. Charlie said. It was at this point that Charlie and Slowhand start getting fucked up. Charlie liked margaritas, and he starts slamming them, along with Slowhand. We had a meal about an hour and a half. Goes by, and these two assholes are smashed. We go out to the tractor. I hop into the driver's seat, and Charlie goes, Okay, here's your test. All you gotta do is get me in slow hand to the terminal, and you pass. I'm like, all right, sweet. It's probably a seven-mile stretch shot with no trailer. Piece of cake. So, off we go. Slow hand is sitting in the passenger side, and Charlie is in the back, digging around in the cabinets of the truck. Slow hand starts asking me about how many months has gone. What I've been through... Slowhand starts asking me about how many months has gone by and what I've been put through, experience-wise, yada yada. Charlie says, hey, <laughs> look. Everything becomes slow motion at that point. I turn my head to look, and Charlie has his giant Tennessee sausage of a dick out. And when I see it, he does the propeller move an inch from my face. It was a shock, to say the least. Charlie and Slohan thought it was the funniest thing they had ever seen. Slohan signed off on my paperwork when we got back. Welcome to trucking. Story 3. Around 2007-2008, I was a trucker, and it was about 2.30 in the morning in Georgia. I was in the sticks about 100 miles north of Atlanta on I-75, and I was alone in a drop yard for trailers. I was there to drop off my current trailer and hook another one. All I had to do was go pick up my paperwork from the mailbox and go. 
I loved shit like this. No bullshit. Load is ready for me to pick up. No waiting around. Great. Now, my entire life, there has been this weird phenomenon that has followed me. You know those halogen street lights? I would say about 60 to 70% of those lights I walk under will go dark. It's the strangest thing. If I walk down the street at night, it's not strange at all if every light I walk under goes out. And when I walk away from it, it comes back on. I walk the streets in darkness. I have no idea why it happens. Anyway, back to Georgia. I dropped my first trailer off. Backed under the trailer I'm picking up. Got my paperwork. And I'm raising the landing gear. I'm standing under a big street light and guess what? It goes out. No big deal, but I say out loud to no one in particular. I wonder why this shit keeps happening. At that point, the craziest thing that has ever happened to me in my entire life happened. A calm voice from about three feet away said, Show of respect. A voice. No one was around for miles. I was out in the middle of nowhere. There was no one there. I heard it plain as day. It was a man's voice. It wasn't loud, scary, or intimidating. It spoke very matter-of-factly. Show of respect. I freaked out, jumped in the truck, and moved 80,000 pounds faster than I have ever thought I could move it. I'm not crazy. I have no history of mental illness except for my ADHD, and no history of mental illness in the family. I don't even tell this story to people because of the looks I get. This really did happen. And ever since then, I've wrestled with the question, what does it mean? Last winter, I was driving down the freeway at night, going between suburbs of a large metropolitan area kind of a thing. So there were plenty of cars around, but it was maybe around midnight or so, and it had been snowing, when it isn't always white during winter there. I saw a car pulled over on the shoulder of the freeway with a guy standing next to it, clearly in need of some assistance. I saw them as I was driving past, but since it was later at night and was cold out, I figured I might as well take the next exit, loop around, and see if the guy still needed help. Might get there, and it's a middle-aged, working-class type of guy standing outside of his pickup. He is wearing blue overalls, slender, and is slightly balding, and puts off what I can only describe as a weird vibe. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was one of those weird gut feelings that you aren't sure why you were feeling it. He says that he has been having car troubles. It's from about two hours out of town that his alternator is shot and his battery needs a boost. I've owned a car with a shot alterator and know that when the battery dies, you need to boost it for a little while if you're going to get it running again. I tell him it's no problem. Commiserate with him for a minute. Pop my hood and he says he is going to grab his cables. When he comes back, I noticed in his hand that he has some sort of concealed metal object. No clue what it was. I saw it for just a brief moment and saw that it wasn't a knife, but that it was metal and a little shorter than the length of his hand. And he was clearly trying to keep it concealed from my view. This all happens so fast, and I'm immediately on high alert. I see it for a split second as he's bringing me the cables so that I can hook up my battery. I instantly take a step back to put some distance between us and tell him that he can hook up my battery and I'll wait in the car. All the while, an instantaneous full flight or fight, getting ready to block an attack if he were to lunge at me. He doesn't, and starts connecting the cables to my battery as I'm sitting in my car. I start to wonder if I was imagining things as he connects the battery, and we wait for the battery to charge. 
Maybe it was just something that was bundled in with the cables that he just had in his hand. I don't know. Maybe I misread the situation as dangerous. After a few minutes, he goes to start his car, shouts that it isn't working, and then walks back towards my car, where he waits in front of my car. After a few minutes of waiting, he puts his head back under the hood of my car to fiddle with the cables. All the while, I'm of course watching him intently to make sure he doesn't come to my car window, because I was still spooked. He shouts some things about how it isn't working and asks me to come out to take a look. I open my window a bit, casually tell him not to worry and that it's probably just going to take some time. Luckily, I can just barely see my battery in the dark through the gap under the popped hood of my car through the windshield directly in front of me. I see him then fiddle with the cables and hear him shout again that it isn't working and for me to come out. Then I see him slip out the metal object I had seen earlier and see him touch it to my battery terminal as sparks shoot out from where he touched it. He starts yelling and jumps back as I immediately jump out of my car and tell him that something came up and that I needed to go now. I honestly don't remember much of what he was trying to say as I cut him off or exactly what I said. Outside of that, I needed to get the fuck out of there without taking my eyes off of him for even half a second. I don't even remember how the cables came off my battery. Did I pull them? Were they already off? I don't know. But I slammed that hood shut, jumped in my car, and sped off. I still had no idea what his plan was, no clue what he was trying to do, or what on earth he was trying to make happen. But I do know, for a fact, that what I saw him do is in no way what he was telling me he was doing. But as I left him there and drove off, I was practically pinching myself trying to make heads or tails of what just happened. And I cannot stress this enough, that the guy just gave off the weirdest vibes. Like the hills have eyes kind of weird vibes. Maybe he was planning on trying to short my battery so that I got stuck there. But still to this day, I wonder if I encountered some sort of mass murderer who had been planning on kidnapping someone at the side of the freeway as they stopped to help. Who knows? But either way, it was weird as fuck. Right spooked me. And note the hell away from that dude as soon and fast as humanly possible. I still wish that I had gotten a license plate or something to give to the cops. But in that moment, the only thing going through my mind was just to remove myself from that situation as fast and as humanly as possible. little late for this, but here's my story. For the last seven years, I have been a bull hauler. I've seen some messed up stuff having to do with cattle, but the scariest thing that ever happened to me was on a trip to East Texas. I had left out from around Austin and went up to just north of Amarillo to kick off at a feedlot. It was around a 600-mile trip. I was feeling pretty good, so I decided to turn around and come on back to the cattle company instead of taking my break. I called dispatch and he gave me a sale barn to go pick up and bring back to the company. When I got back, I was pretty wore out, but they told me that a truck had broken down heading to Texarkana and he needed me to go and get the cattle. I thought, sure, I can do this. I made it about an hour from Texacarno on a little two-lane Texas back road, talking to a friend of mine on the phone to try and stay awake when I fell asleep. I remember hearing my friend yelling my name and waking up just to find myself off in the grass with a cowboy on a horse right in front of me roping a calf. He roped, dulled off, and turned to face me, and just as I hit him, he disappeared. It was a hallucination. 
scared me so bad. I was wide awake the rest of that trip. I used to think being outlaw was me being a badass. I'd run 1,500 to 2,000 miles with no sleep and just called another day at work. I realize now that it was just me being stupid and putting myself and innocent people in danger. A few years ago, my brother and I were driving a 15-hour drive overnight across three provinces in Canada to meet up with our parents and other family at our grandmother's house. It was summer, and it was raining and flooding a lot of the roads that year, so we had to go off the main route that we would take, Trans-Canada Highway. And we're taking some more rural roads we never usually drove on this trip. We've driven it many times. In the middle of Saskatchewan, at about 2 to 3 a.m., we were on a road called Louis Real Trail. We had noticed and made some comments to each other about no one being around, and so we were hoping that the roads weren't closed or redirected up ahead again. We both had noticed it had just seemed like the road was totally deserted, but also it wasn't the main highway, so we thought maybe that was why no one else was around. As we were going along, we started to notice dead deer on the sides of the road. Quite a few, mind you. I remember saying something about hoping not to hit one. Then suddenly, we were on a strip of road for a solid five to ten minutes, where both sides of the road were absolutely covered in deer, literal piles of dead deer, on top of each other, mangled together, eyes open and shining in the headlights, clearly deceased, the way they were piled and twisted up, like backwards necks and feet up in the air and shit like that. None in the middle of the road, though, like they'd been hit by vehicles. No blood or gore, just hundreds of intact dead deer bodies lining and piling on top of each other, on both sides of the road. I remember just staring at them and looking over at the dead piles, other side of the road on occasion, and one of us saying something about being in between walls of dead deer. It sounds really fucked up, I know, but my brother remembers it too, feeling like we were in a daze or something. Like in hindsight, it should have really freaked us out, but I just remember staring at them and seeing their eyes shining. And I remember thinking something like it looked like they were all looking back at me, wondering why there were so many, wondering why no one else was around, but really just not saying anything and just mindlessly driving through for several moments. It wasn't until after we had driven past them and there were other vehicles and semi-trucks passing us by again that we sort of snapped out of it and said, that was really fucked up. What was that? I had been taking photos of everything that trip. Random clouds, cows in the field, my feet on the dashboard, but I didn't think for a second to take a picture of the bizarre road lined with dead deer on both sides. Because I was, like, not thinking properly when it happened for some reason. Me and my brother talk about this often. It bothers us now because we both remember how weird it was. But saying it to other people never seems to justify the absurdity. I don't think people believe it happened, but we both witnessed it and felt the same thing. This was about 12 years ago. My husband's family has a mountain house across the state. Once we get off the turnpike, we take one single country road up over a mountain and down the other side to our house. It's about a 30-minute ride on this winding mountain road. In the middle section, near the top of the mountain, it is the most winding part, 
and the word slow is written across the road in giant letters. We take this road maybe six to 10 times a year, up and back. I had been up to the house dozens of times at this point, and nothing odd ever happened in the trip until this one random time. My husband was driving, I'm the passenger, and no other people in the car. There is a Billy Joel song playing on the iPod through the car speakers. I think it was Uptown Girl. There is no radio reception anywhere near this remote mountain. As we approach the area where slow is written across the road, a man's voice, not Billy Joel, comes through the car speakers and says in his deep ass creepy voice, slow down. These words were not in the song that was playing. My husband and I looked at each other like, oh my God, did you hear that? What the fuck? Yeah, we both heard it. No idea where it came from since there's no houses or anything on the side of the mountain. And we didn't pass any other cars on the way down. But we do laugh about it and bring it up every time we drove up the side of the mountain and see the word slow on the pavement. It never happened again in the hundreds of trips we've made since that night. I was a long haul trucker for a few years and just spending every day out on the road is pretty crazy. You see a lot through the windshield of a truck. A lot of people naturally assume that truckers are male kind of like Reddit, and women will flash you a lot. I also discovered that a lot of men will masturbate as they commute to work. Once they see that you are a female, they like to masturbate for you. The images that stick with me the most are the dead people, you see. There was a bad accident one night in Chicago, and it was very late, rainy on the interstate, by Wrigley Field and I could see the flashing lights in the opposing lane. I don't usually rubberneck because I just don't want to see other people's misfortune, but this time I did. There was a dead family lying broken on the road, and the first responders were pretty much just standing around waiting for the coroner to arrive. I can still see the flashing lights in the rain and the little dead baby lying 30 feet away from its dead parents. I wish I had never looked. Another time, again, near Chicago, probably around Gary, I saw a possible truck driver in a fancy car driving erratically on the interstate. I called the police and gave them the mile marker we were at so they could try to stop it. I lost sight of the car as it sped off, but a few miles down the road, it was flipped over on the other side of the freeway engulfed in flames. I don't think the driver made it out. There was no one standing beside it. One night in northern Ontario, I was climbing a hill on a single lane blacktop, and just as I crest the hill, there is the minivan coming straight at me in my lane, and a long line of cars that they are passing in the other lane. I have nowhere to go, and I'm not allowed to leave my lane of traffic, even if it means killing you. So I hit the brakes, even managing to lean forward and grab the trailer spike to use all the brakes, knowing two things. I'm about to kill someone in this minivan, and that I'm about to be covered in thousands of gallons of horse piss that I was hauling in the trailer. Luckily, the stupid minivan was able to go back into the other lane when the other vehicles started hitting their brakes to avoid the incident that was about to happen. Things like that, I remember. Nearly driving in accidents, nearly killing people as they cut you off, not realizing how long it takes for a truck to stop. There are good days to driving a truck, but the bad ones were the reason I quit and never went back.
This summer, my 17-year-old daughter was working a late-night shift. It was a little after midnight when I left to pick her up. When I stepped outside, it was eerily silent. You couldn't hear the frogs, insects, nothing. I stood there just waiting to hear them again, but I had this awful feeling something was watching me. I got in the car and just shook off the weird feelings and turned the radio up loud to distract myself. So I start driving down the road with my brights on. We have many deers in the area. and make a right-hand turn onto another road. Making the turn, my headlights caught a glimpse of something. It was black, quick, and jumped from the roadway onto the side of a steep hill on the opposite side. I was scared at this moment. I was afraid to drive past this area. For the remaining drive, I kept trying to rationalize what I had just seen. Was it a deer? Small animal? Hell, maybe an alien? The possibilities were endless, but I had never seen anything like it. When we made it home, the nightlife noises were back and thriving. There was no eerie feeling that something was lurking nearby. A couple weeks had passed and I had spoken with a neighbor. He lives about 10 minutes away. We live way out in the country in the middle of nowhere. And she said some weird things have been happening around here. I thought she meant maybe a thief for coyotes that were around. Then she said, You might think I'm crazy, but... She goes on to tell me about how silent it would get at night, more often, and there was some dark figure that they had seen. Not just her, but also a few other people that live nearby. So I tell her my ordeal of the night I had experienced. I told her it was hard to explain why, what I had seen, because I'd never seen anything else like it. She asked me, did it look like a Dementor from Harry Potter? Oh my goodness, uh, yeah. She tells me her sister-in-law was out visiting and left after it was dark to go home. Driving close to the area where my house is located, my neighbor gets a call from her sister-in-law that's screaming and hysterically crying. They drove to where she was and was too scared to even open the car door. Eventually, she is able to tell them she's seen something black crouching over the roadway. She slows down and is being cautious, but this black figure stands up and jumps to the nearest tree and climbs up it so fast and disappears. She was so shaken that they had to drive her home. It never happened again. I haven't heard any other stories from this from my few neighbors. I will forever be cautious when it goes silent on a hot summer's night. Who can I even share this with, other than a few close neighbors that had seen the mysterious black figure too? If I told anyone else, then they'd think I was crazy. Winters are usually silent here, and I hope whatever this thing is has moved on or at least is hibernating for the winter. All right, so here's one of my stories. I'm not a trucker, but a dispatcher. We had a driver who had, hmm, shall we say, an odor problem. I'm not talking like body odor or like sweat. I'm talking like stale urine. Anytime he'd come into the dispatch office, it was a race to get him to leave again. The kind of putrid tang that would make you gag immediately and completely involuntarily, regardless of your best efforts. Driver was a rather heavy set guy. Nice enough, but a little slow. We let it go until we started getting complaints from customers about the smell. Now, this driver was a flatbed driver, meaning most of his deliveries were onto construction sites, job sites, steel, and lumber mills, etc. 90% of his deliveries were outdoors and in the company of rough and tough dudes who otherwise wouldn't give a damn what you smelled like. 
We'd get a couple phone calls a week from a job foreman saying that they wouldn't take this guy onto their site anymore because even outdoors, the smell was too bad for the workers. We started delicately attempting to bring it up, trying to urge proper hygiene, etc. He claimed he showered every day or every other day at worst, and that's just what he smelled like and has had that problem for a long time as he could remember. Nothing he could do. All right. At this point, he had to bring his truck in for maintenance. It was a company truck. He didn't even own it. But we don't rotate trucks, so he had the same one for months. Something had to be checked into at the gear shift, so the mechanic had to get inside the truck. Upon climbing into this cab, the mechanic promptly did a 180 and puked out of the driver's side door. It was then that he discovered a big-ass bucket of piss. I'm not talking like a Gatorade bottle or something that he took a leak in, so he didn't have to stop one time. I'm talking like a job site shop bucket filled nearly to the top with human piss. The floor was wet all around it, indicating it had splashed out. The inside of the cab, I'm told, because I was too chicken shit to get near this thing, smelt like him, but times ten. It was basically pure, concentrated evil. Plus, the walls of the cab had a slight yellow and brown dull sheen. We fired the driver using the complaints from customers as the excuse, and then parked the truck outside in our yard, doors and windows open for a week just to dull it. Then had a guy with a ghetto pieced together hazmat type suit, rubber gloves, rubber boots, mask, rain slicker, etc. Go in and basically douse the whole thing in bleach and cleaners. No matter what they did, they could not get rid of that smell. That truck sat outside in our yard for a full year, windows and doors standing wide open. Rain, snow, blustery wind. It just set open to the element. One day, a year later, the boss decided to close it up and see how it was. Just as bad as the day they tried to clean it. He scrapped the truck a week later. This is my father's story, and he wasn't a long-haul truck driver, but rather a 18-year-old gas station attendant in the late 70s. And without a certain long-haul trucker, I probably wouldn't be here. The gas station was 24 hours, and my dad was the only one working the night shift. 11 to 7, I think. A guy comes in and just gives him the creeps. Seems pretty sketchy. He was wearing a tight jacket and pants, and you could tell he had something in his pants under the jacket. It was during the summer, and it was warm, so why is he wearing a jacket to begin with? It was later confirmed he was on drugs. A lot of truck drivers used the station as it was the only one open 24 hours for a long stretch of the highway. They also had a big lot where they let truckers park and sleep or take a break. On this night, at this time, it was just my dad, sketchy dude, and one trucker in there. He kinda knew, as in came in frequent enough to be conversational, and asked if he'd stay in the station and hang out until the sketchy dude left. Well, after looking at these stocked shells for several moments, while sneaking peeks at my dad behind the counter, the sketchy guy eventually looked fed up and got into his blue car and sped off. Cool trailer guy hung out with my dad a little longer until another couple of guys came in to use the booths they had to eat a sandwich. I should also point out, this was pretty middle of nowhere rural southeast United States and it was the 1970s. CB and landline was it. My dad only had a landline in the store. Dad did not have any protection or a weapon of any kind. 
So the hours passed and my dad had shaken off the paranoia, when all of a sudden, this guy in a car comes hauling ass into the lot, jumps out, and sprints into the store, hollering he needs a phone. He didn't have a CB, nor did he see a phone at the other station. He also wasn't familiar with the area, and my dad's station was the first place he found. He calls 911 to report he had walked in on the gas station 40 miles back, next closest station, mind you, to find the attendant shot and dead. No one else was around, and the only other piece of information is that a blue car was speeding out of the lot when the trailer pulled in. Apparently, they eventually apprehend the guy in the blue car. My dad confirms it was Sketchy Dude from earlier in the night, and they charge him with murder and armed robbery. To the long-haul driver who waited around with my dad that night, thank you, and I hope you're keeping it real. This is also worth adding here, that apparently the sketchy guy in the blue car was already a bad apple, who was either being looked for or on probation or something. He sure, in fact, was in the system. I'm going to apologize ahead of time as this is a really long story. I live in a small town on the border of Texas and Mexico. I was always raised to be very independent and had learned to drive at the age of 12. I was a late in life child and my father died when I was young, so it was just my mother and I. At 14, I was a pretty good driver because I had been driving for a couple of years, but I was still a kid. Anyways, my family in Fort Worth had an emergency, and my mother decided that I was going to drive us up there. My mother didn't drive, so I was going to be doing all of the driving from the border to Fort Worth, which is an eight-hour drive at 14 years old. I was a little afraid, and so I got a church friend of mine to go with me. He was cool, maybe about 35, and a recovering alcoholic. Since it was an emergency, we took off at about midnight. Since I wasn't experienced at driving on freeways, only country roads, we decided to take nothing but small town highways. There are two Texas cities that connect with a small road, that it is so old that it is rather creepy at night. We just have two lanes and no shoulder. At one point, the road crosses a river, and the lanes got even smaller. However, only one car can pass the river at a time, because it's more like a lane and a half and not two. It's okay because it's only about 20 yards to cross the river. Also, when the river is flooded, there was just no way through because the bridge would be underwater. No guardrails or anything so you can just drive your car into the river if you choose to. So, at about two or three in the morning, my mother, my friend, and I were traveling down this creepy, lonely, deserted road in the middle of nowhere. Of course, I'm driving because at 14, I own my own car, and I was going to drive my damn car. After almost an hour of not seeing another car on the road, we notice that there's a truck coming in the opposite direction. Let me clarify. We saw headlights coming. I noticed and anticipated reaching us at a certain time because of how fast they were going, but took longer than I expected. I realized it was because they stopped moving and just stopped in the middle of the highway. When I finally passed them, they were at a full stop and made a U-turn as soon as we passed them. This was creepy because we were the only two cars out on the road. They quickly gained on us, stayed right behind us. All of us were awake and are incredibly nervous, even though we haven't spoken about what was happening. But it was a big truck and we were in a low regular sedan, so their headlights were flooding the car with illumination and honestly, just blinding us. Finally, my friend says to slow down and let them pass. 
I came down to about 30 miles per hour, and the truck would not pass and stayed right on my ass. That's when I realized that I need to go to the other extreme and start driving at about 75. This was hard to do on a small meandering country road. As you would expect, they were on my ass the entire time. They kept up with me when I was going fast and slowed down when I went slow. I did it several times and they just would not pass me and stayed right on my ass. Then, after a while of sweating bullets and deciding that would be our last stand, some light starts flashing from the truck. It was really strange because it wasn't an obviously marked police or government vehicle. I do remember it was a Chevy truck with a half camper in the back where you can pop up a bed. It was easy to recognize because my cousin had one, just like it, and it was awesome. So we're dealing with flashing lights as if a cop is trying to pull us over. My friend immediately said, don't you dare pull over. This could be a bunch of drunk rednecks who decided to outfit the truck with some flashing lights and want to have some fun with us before calling it a night after getting drunk while hunting. Who knows what they were doing or what they were going to do. After a couple of minutes of going back and forth, I finally decided to pull over. And then we just sat there till they decided to get out of the truck. One got out of each side of the truck and came up to my vehicle. Finally, there's a knock on the window and they ask us for our documents because they were the border patrol. I didn't know where there to get off or hug them because they weren't crazy people trying to hurt us or smack them for scaring the shit out of us. They were in an unmarked vehicle for better undercover surveillance. So, as soon as they checked us out, we left and continued on our way. Even though we were driving at night, that adrenaline rush kept us up the rest of the trip. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true road trip and trucker horror stories. I'd like to take a moment and give a special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Tina Mee, Luz Crispin, C.A.G., Denise Seth, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for continuing to support Back to Ashes. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.